Welcome to the Momentum Lifestyle Podcast, where every Monday we interview an inspiring, educational, and entertaining guest to help you build confidence, find balance, and live a life of impact. We'd like to thank our sponsor today, Be Spunky. Now, Blake, Janoa, and myself have been using their Reboot product for well over six months now, and it has been life-changing. I found myself recovering faster, having way more energy throughout the day, and honestly feeling just more jacked up as a man. And this is because Reboot is clinically formulated to support healthy male hormone levels, providing stress relief, improved strength and stamina, enhanced drive, and overall well-being. Be Spunky Reboot contains a proprietary blend of 10 natural and organic herbs and active ingredients that are renowned for helping men to enhance physical and cognitive performance, improve stamina, energy, and endurance, optimize testosterone levels, support healthy reproductive function, support cardiovascular function, relieve stress, mild anxiety, irritability, relieve tiredness, fatigue, support healthy sleep patterns, and support healthy body weight. So as you can see, it is a must-have product for all men. So head to their website, bespunky.com.au. That's B-E-S-P-U-N-K-I.com.au and use the code MOMENTUM to receive 10% off all Be Spunky products. The Men of Momentum podcast number two. The three musketeers have come back together about a year since our last podcast together, boys. How are we feeling? Mate, it's been too long. Fuck. As, what, I haven't seen Musketeers. You, I think you caught I think you called us the amigos last time. I'm yeah, I was sure. waiting for that too, actually. Yeah. Did have I? we upgraded, downgraded? I don't know where that all sits. That's an upgrade. Musketeers okay, has right, to be an so. upgrade. Yeah. Because amigos are three friends <laughs> and, and, and musketeers went out and saved the world you know they saved their their towns so we're saving the world right so we're musketeers now that makes sense i haven't been called that before but i'm going to run with that for a little bit and at least to our next episode exactly and then we'll level up again and then we'll, yeah. we'll be the three the three bears the three white bears <laughs> <laughs> not really sure um boys what uh what an awesome 12 months that we've had personally um business wise probably in all assets of our lives, we've had a really up-leveling um, 12 months um, with momentum and outside of momentum. So today, let's do a massive reflection on the last 12 months. I think it'd be really good to get out, um, you know, each of our three biggest wins over the last 12 months and um, our three biggest challenges over the last 12 months. You know, the three of us have, um, whilst overall we've we've had a great, great year it's uh not without their challenges and i think it'll be really great if we can delve into that and share with the people what we're going through and hopefully just give as much value um as we can so how does how does that sound boys Mate, maybe uh, even should we put in lessons as well just because that's part of our process win challenge less you want to throw some lessons, lessons in <clears throat> well i think maybe we can we can figure out what the lessons are through the conversation you know yeah. i think you two are really smart and you'll be able to figure out what my lessons mm. are you know, and I'm, and then me, me and Blake can figure out Genoa's and Genoa and me can figure out yours, Blake. How does that sound? I like that. I like that. Lessons all around. Beautiful. Just a lot. Here for you, Rizzy. Ready to go. Just a, just a lot of lessons. All right. Well, Jay, if you're ready to go, mate, why don't you kick us off, brother? Give me, let's hear about your wins, mate. Let's hear about your wins over the last, yeah, 12 months this year, 2021. What, uh, what was brought in for you and, and what were those massive wins for you? I was trying to like look at what the, the overarching sort of themes were for me and and one has to be around my my business or our businesses as well. Because obviously uh, not only do all three of us work in momentum, but we all each have our own business as well. And so for me, one of the biggest wins is looking back at this year and seeing what I've been able to achieve and and you know, because obviously my business was sort of st- had started a little bit before. I started, you know, jumping on, on momentum. And then since then, I've obviously changed it a few times and have evolved and shifted to the online space. And the whole online world was brand new to me. You know, I had no idea about it. I literally only ever taught meditation in person. So I very quickly had to adapt to be able to, you know, do online um, mm. teaching and the whole online world. And, you know, also given... I think even your Instagram, you had like 
500 followers on Instagram, I think. Yeah, maybe you know, like all that ago. kind of stuff. Like yeah. my resistance to showing up on video, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, I was that wasn't what I was great at. You know, uh, you boys were a lot further ahead of me in, in that in that sense. And so it was, I really had to step into it and just own my own my space and get out of my own way and get out of my comfort zone and, you know, show up on the videos and throw myself into a, into a world that was quite uh, new to me. And to now feel like confident in, in what I'm doing and to look back at the two businesses that I've been part of creating and seeing the impact that I'm having and also a little of consistency. Like, you know, there's been ups and downs, but overall I'm still like in my personal business, I'm still calling in clients and I've, I've changed, mm. changed my, um, my offering as well a few times, even with some, you know, it's not the greatest um, idea within a business even within a year to keep changing what you do as well. And like, and I've sort of been moving around a bit as to, am I just the meditation guy now? Do I do more mentoring? Do I work on coaching women in my own business, you know, and there's sort of been a few changes. So it feels really empowering for me to know that even with me moving around and changing and learning and growing, I'm still able to maintain a business that can support me, which is, which is really, really, um, it's a big, big win. And it's exciting because there's also a lot of fear, you know, when I, when you go into it, it's like, can I actually make this work? There's a lot mm. of self doubt. It's like, fuck, can I like almost felt surreal to, to think mm. of the fact that I could create a business from scratch in an, in an area that I was new at. Cause my, you know, my history prior to, working with meditation and mentoring people had nothing to do with that. I was working in alcohol sales and you know, I've been in corporate for a bit. So it wasn't like I was using my old skills to help me build this. It was all new and learning. So it's just a really, um, it's a good feeling to sit back and look at what I've created for myself and what I've been part of creating with you two lads and see also that it's, it is growing. Both of them are growing and there's the impact we're having. Like every time I jump on a call, you know what it's like with you boys, we jump on and we hear some of the guys talk about, you know, the experience they've had. And it's like, fuck yeah, like you're doing this. Yeah, it's just yeah. really, really, you know, it's a really, really cool feeling. It's inspiring as well. It keeps inspiring me again when you have those periods where you're like, you know what, <sighs> it's, it's getting yeah. harder. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. What, so got that, you, what got you through the self-doubt? Like, I, th I feel like that's common, like such a common thing is, yeah. is this paralyzing self-doubt. And for a lot of people, that's what it does is it paralyzes them so they don't take action. But for you, you were able to move through the self-doubt or move past it and build, you know, a successful business where mm. you, you're not working at a cafe anymore. You're not taking the bins out like BWT was two years ago. You know, you, you weren't cleaning, cleaning the mop in the floors of a cafe like I was 12 months ago. So <laughs> how did you move through the self-doubt? I think there were sort of two bits to it. One was um, focusing on a craft and becoming a jet at that. So meditation was that platform for me. So I know that I am very good at teaching meditation and I'm happy to sit in any conversation and talk about meditation and the, the ins and outs of it and teach it. And I'm like, I'm very good at that because I, I initially I just focused on an area and, and probably some of you boys like at the beginning, it's great to sort of like, you know, shotgun approach and try to do with everything. Like at first, like nail one modality. And so you've mm. got this confidence. You're like, I know this stuff. Um, and have that to show up with. So there wasn't like I was just sort of scattering around a few different pieces. And the other thing was to not get too caught up in comparing myself and looking at all the, the jet coaches that were out there, like the, you know, the big names and, and know that all I needed to be was a little bit ahead of someone. And that's enough for me to be able to teach and help them through it without getting too caught up in needing to be the best and, you know, the, the top of the game straight away. Because when you get caught up in that, and obviously, you know, part of, researching and, and studying is you study in uh, people who are ahead of you. And then often you can get, I can get caught up in going, geez, I don't know anywhere near as much as these guys. Maybe I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. That imposter syndrome comes in and all the rest. And so I'd check myself back in and go, actually, let's look at how many people in the world don't know what I know and could benefit from what I know. Mm. I'm like, that's all I need for a successful business. Yeah. You know what I mean? And just to bring it back down to that instead of comparing. And so that, well, there were the, the two things is that I've refined a craft. So there's one area in particular, I was like, this is what I'm great at. And I can, I can, can be, um, begin talking about that with confidence and then start weaving in other bits and pieces. And then it's to really look at like, well, what are the group of people that I can, um, that I can impact and, and can help. 
and they were the two things that really helped me move through and I had those moments of like oh you know am I good enough to be doing this or who am I to be showing up like this and teaching people so um yeah there were there were some big uh big drivers yeah. one of my I'm favorite thinking... quotes go back go back you go. No, you go. Nah, 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 you go BWT <laughs> One of the, the things um, to kind of, as an observer of Jay and having spent every day with him pretty much for the last 15 months to, and just to kind of preface this, because a lot of the work that we do individually um, and as part of momentum works with business owners. And, you know, one of the, I guess, issues that isn't spoken of that much is that a lot of your business problems are actually personal problems wrapped up as business problems. So self-worth, mm. doubt, whatever it may be. So one of the things I want to say, and I'm sure Jay would, would you know, be open to this as well, is like that's not a smooth process that he's been through over the last 15 months. Like I've seen him in moments of doubt. I've seen him have second guess, you know, sometimes how he's going about things. I've seen, you know, when him and I have had a, a, a good night out, like our, our head, you know, which actually doesn't happen that often, but our, our headset for the next three days is a little bit doubting and things like that. Mm -hmm. So... I want to kind of preface everything that Jay said and, and what you said deals around how do you move through it with that's not a smooth process. That doesn't just yeah. happen. For like sure. there's a lot of ups and downs in that 15 month process. Well, last 12 months in particular, but having spent every day with him for the last 15 months as well. Yeah. It's yeah. actually, that's a really good point is to the, the fact that it's not always up. And when you are down is to not allow those thoughts just to fucking run off with you and go like, this is just my mind doing its thing right now. Cause we, there's, it is, it has been like this, you know, mm -hmm. up and down, up and down. And so when you're in those, those lulls, the kicker there is to go, this is just a little phase of self doubt that I'm passing through. This is not my state and not, not true. And I want to move mm -hmm. through it. And you always, you always do in the end. So yeah, it's just those not letting those, those down times really, really stick with you and, and drag you for, for too long and, and know they aren't your yeah. truth. And I think too, like a, less, a lesson for me over the last 12 months with you, with, with which, which, which you boys have flagged with me a couple of times and I didn't get it at the time, probably as you were flagged with me, but also like when you're on those highs, not necessarily don't enjoy the highs, but don't let them run away from don't let it run away from you and you you kind of get so caught up in the high because I found you get too caught up in the high. Well, what happens when you're back in the low? Then you're like, oh, fuck, I'm here again. Like, what the hell? How did I get here? And you just beat yourself up and then you go back to the top of the roller coaster and you're like, yeah, sweet, this is bloody awesome. You get nice and loud and chirpy and then you fall back down. You're like, oh, what the hell am I doing back down here again? So there's also like a level of when you're in the highs too, like, yes, enjoy it embrace the high feel it but utilize the momentum to just keep focusing on the action part rather than like cool i've had a good month let's go have a blowout on the weekend every weekend for the next month and then you're like get to the end of the month like oh where'd that money go or why is my mental health really poor now you know it's like okay we're on the high let's cement the let's keep the good practices going you know it's like jay i'm sure you with your meditation have found people will get themselves out of a hole through meditation and then they're like oh i'm really good now i don't need that anymore and then a month later, they're, they're like, oh, I'm shit again. And you're like, well, did you meditate the last month? You're like, no. It's like, well, let's keep doing the practices even when we're going up up and about. It's, it's, it's true because there's when things are good, we we suddenly forget about all the, the shit off them. We're like, oh, actually, last mm. fucking we drop all the things that we, that we think we need. Uh, yeah. And when, because life, no matter what's going on, like the world doesn't, like the world's still going to happen. Shit's still going to happen. Um, mm. The ability to be, adaptable and resilient when things go to shit because naturally that's the way the world works it comes in i always call it the pendulum swing whenever i'm sitting yeah. in, in the, i'm going to quote um this this really good uh, term sitting in the fire you know i don't want to hear where i heard thriving in the fire yeah there it is thriving in the fire um, <laughs> i know i know that the pendulum swings yeah. And also the other way around, when I'm sitting there and life's great, I'm like, also, I'm probably going to hit a little lull again. And that's also mm -hmm. all right. It's not pessimistic. It's realistic. It's like, yeah. you're going to come in swings. Um, yeah, I, I, like, I like that you've uh, picked up on that also for yourself, deals in terms of not getting too yeah. carried away in the, the ups. And, um, yeah. This I think too just shall, to take that... shall pass. I think just to take that a step further as well, for those that um, might be struggling to grasp that concept, 
that doesn't mean that you numb yourself out to the highs and the lows. Yeah. That just means that you can ground yourself in the highs mm. and remain confident and positive in the lows. Like the highs really aren't as high as you think they are and the lows generally aren't as bad as you think they are either. So just managing that mindset through that kind of transition, if you get caught up in your own like, um, you know, your own juice when things are up and you just get, you know, you go up yeah. and up, you lose your way and at the bottom, you can really sink yourself, um, which I think, you know, all three of us have been at different times. You can really yeah. sink yourself thinking things are darker than they are as well. So it's not to numb yourself out, like to fully embody what you're feeling and what you're going through, but just keep it in that kind of ledger. Mm, yeah, I really like that. Ground yourself in your highs and be confident that you'll get out of your lows. I like that. That's, mm. that's, that's spot on. Let's get a little yeah. template for um, Instagram and we'll yeah, get your face like and put that yeah. up there. And that'll just, that'll go viral. You'll probably get 10,000 followers just from that mm. quote beat ups. That's, that's 8.58 AM on Thursday, the 7th of October, guys. If you want to um, reference that. Yeah. You're welcome. Awesome. hundred years time, people, philosophers <laughs> will be looking back on, on the Blake Royal Thompson era. Um, uh, Jay, that's great. First win legend, maybe a couple more in there. So Matt, what, what other wins do you have for us that you wanted to share? So another big one for me is my ability to adapt and let go of how I think things should be. And as both you boys know in the past, I'm very much in control of how things should, particularly Blake, you've seen, obviously we know each other a bit longer. Um, have always been very much like attached to how things should look and have erred on the level uh, on the phase of being like almost a control freak, like needing things to be a certain way and it can be very overpowering and, and controlling. And, you know, I was kind of obviously forced to, by the circumstances that we were all thrown, move with what was going on. And I, I just am so, I look back now at this last sort of uh, 18, 18 months to two years and my ability to, I call it sitting loose in the saddle. Like if you're, the story is if you're sitting on a horse and you're, you're clenched and your legs are tight and you, you grip like this, if the horse bucks, you're going to feel it really hard and you're probably going to fall off. But if you're sitting and you're able to move with the horse and the horse bucks a bit, you know, you can move with it and, and, and go with it. And I, I feel that this is something that I've cultivated um, really, really strongly over the last um, two years. And it's just, it's empowering. And I feel really confident to know that I can move with whatever's going on. Like mm. from, you know, having nowhere to, to, to live. Uh, when I you know left Sydney, was moving to um, Melbourne with you, Blake, and we all sort of had all the stuff in our car and let's go up here. We lived in, you know, hostel for a bit. We were in a caravan, caravan park, you know, even mm. there were times we were both looking at our bank accounts and going, what are we going to do? Like, yeah. <laughs> what are we doing next month? You know, and, and so the ability to not get too attached to, we're meant to be living here and the business should be doing this and we should have these clients and this is how it all should look. And it's to go, okay, this is what's, what's happening. Now, even something so simple as, you know, the gym's being shut down. I was like, it was like, all right, let's start training a different way. And I just started running more and instead, like there was less time spent in um, like wallowing, you know, and like, you know, you can, when you get like wallowing, like, oh, fuck, if only this had happened or why isn't this happening or rah, rah, there was less time spent in that. I was like, okay, this is annoying. I still get, I still get angry still get upset you know hurt when you don't say get chosen by the girl or you know you don't get the client that you wanted that still feels but the mm. ability to go all right that wasn't for me what's next um it's just yeah. empowering like it, it decreases the amount of ch negative shitty chatter and energy that used to go into the stories around things not turning out and being the way they should be according to my skewed skewed mm. view of that plan <laughs> and yeah that's, that's really really it makes me so much more confident to literally take anything that comes my way. It's like, you know what? Um, it's really, really, that's one of the biggest things that shifted. And you probably it, it, went through the pendulum swing there too, as well, a little bit. I remember maybe six months ago, you were in the momentum business. You were very like laissez faire with everything that was going on. And that, and then we were like, Jay, yep, yeah, you can, you can, you have permission to step back into fucking bring some structure to our business because that's your strength. And then sure enough, the last six months, bang, like the structure has been spot on and it's been really good. So similar thing, like with that pendulum analogy, it was like, Oh, uh, 
do whatever. And then, um, bang, you were back in. BWT, what were you, uh, what were you going to say, brother? I was just going to say, one of the obviously known Jay quite well is, you know, control is something that we used to laugh about with him and his desire to hold on so tight and at times be quite rigid in that approach. And when, you, when you're working through something, that can often be multi-layered in terms of obviously proactively choosing not to be, but it might be a breakdown of beliefs that you've got. You know, it might be some clearing, some healing. What, is there anything, Jay, that kind of rings true for you in terms of what that process looked like? Obviously, naturally, you find a way to... Um, loosen a little i mean you've got that mantra which helps you or that that kind of motto and obviously meditation would help somewhat but is there a belief that fell away is there a process that you went through to take less control because one of the things i'm finding both with momentum and my work is people at the moment are losing their fucking minds because they're trying to control the uncontrollable future which at the moment is as unsettling as it's ever been and it's really fucking with them. So what's that process been for you like over the last 18 months? There's a, there's a couple of parts to that. One is look like practicing or using a bit of hindsight. So the amount of times I've at the time been like so in a, in a pile of shit going, fuck, I didn't get this thing I wanted or, you know, this, this client that I wanted or the girl didn't choose me or whatever it was and just sat in that. But then in, a, in six months or a year time, I look back and go on, Actually, the fact that I didn't get that, look what happened um, as a byproduct. I had this other opportunity. So the first was to look back at some old scenarios that I was, that at the time I was really um, hit by and to see the opportunity and gift in that because I needed to start, I needed to start rewiring how my, my brain viewed things. It was like, okay, I'm going to wallow and look at the what ifs and the what I didn't have or look at it and go, this is like preference-based thinking. So we, we always, we what we tend to do is we put a lot of, things that are once into the needs category. You know, we only really have a few basic needs as human beings, right? And I would argue the majority of us that are here, you know, us three and listening would almost have most of them met. The rest are just preferences or wants. You know, I want this amount of money to be my bank account. You know, I want the business to look like this. I want to have call in this type of um, partner. They're not needs, they're wants. And when I can look mm -hmm. at it and go, I actually don't need it to be exactly like that um, to be okay and and switch it to, so what's the opportunity in this? Like, what can I take out of this? Because when I started to learn and look back at the past and go, oh, actually, there were some amazing opportunities that came from me not getting that thing and, and, and look at that and then start looking at that moving forward. So when I was sitting in times of like, oh, this isn't playing out to try to shorten that sort of hindsight window and go, okay, maybe what's in this, what's in this, what's in this for me? And I know the amount of pain that that, that, that caused me. So that was, a, that was, that's a really big process that I've, um, that I've used. And, and also, I mean, you, you sort of touched on it before is to look at, well, and this look at what I can, what I can impact. And mm -hmm. I think you mentioned this at the beginning where, you know, and this would be also a big lesson of, of mine is to, if you want to change your experience of the world, it's around working internally in yourself, right? Mm. It's not hoping for things to play out a certain way and then you can be okay. It's like, okay, mm. so how can I work on myself in internally so I can um, have a better experience of the world? And so in the internal stuff is stuff that I can actually have a level of control of. I can source out a, a coach to work with. I can source out a book to dive into some deep, you know, old wounding stuff like that's all stuff within my control uh, and to focus less on everyone else and everyone else and getting caught up in the victim and the poor me and look at okay cool what can I take out of this and what can I um work on within myself so um that there were some ways that I started to, to process and move myself through to, to shift um how I dealt with things not going to, to plan I've been quite uh obsessed with that cliche control what you can control and really trying to dissect well what like what does that mean what does control what you can control mean and and what i found is the more that i've thought about it and looked at it in in my clients in my business and the clients that we've got at momentum and the, and the men of momentum is that 
the less control that you feel that you have in your own life. So when your habits start to fall away, when you start to eat unhealthy, when you start to meditate less, when you start to, you know, sleep in more, stay up late, not, you know, lose your workout routine, you also then start to focus more on the stuff that you can't control. So then you start to focus more on what's the world, what's happening in the world. Oh, fuck the COVID. Oh, can you become obsessed with that? Because I think it's because you're losing control in your life and you're trying to gain it back somewhere else. Whereas if you can stay really cemented in controlling the controllable, you have less of a desire to, or you have less of a need to control the uncontrollable because you're like, cool, I'm solid. I'm waking up at the same time. I'm meditating, I'm journaling, I'm working out, I'm eating good. My business is, it, it might've taken a hit this year, but it's going okay. The family's doing this, that. But if whilst you're in that space, you actually feel a lot better. When you start to lose that space or lose it, you start to go, wow, where, where else can I regain the control I've lost? And then that's such a slippery, slippery slope. It's, it's interesting, I mean, working with a lot of women this year and really you guys know how much I love kind of challenging um, the system. Yeah. One of the things that I've, every now and then, don't mind just looking at different ways of going about things. One well, of the, the things that I've been so really... Good for us, BWT. <laughs> the system's so good for us, man. What are you talking works about? works for us in a number of ways. <laughs> um, one of the things that I've been really interested in and, you know, like to be fair, I, I prior to probably the last 18 months haven't really looked into it, is the patriarchy. And also, I guess, where we come from as men and some of the things that we've been indoctrinated into, which has been... Um, an area of interest I know for you as well, Dils. Oh, yeah. One of the <laughs> one of the things I find really interesting is the level of control that men uh, have or feel the need to have over their partners. It's fucking mind blowing. And you know, one of the things that I've realised as I've unpacked the feminine, and you guys know I did a um, feminine collapse. Might have even been last year now. It feels like a lifetime ago. A lot of that came up for me and it's not like I didn't choose, you know, without kind of playing victim and, and discounting this, like I didn't even realize that I'd taken on these beliefs or, or approaches. And I think a lot of men from a unconscious place have taken this on. And often it's not from a malice place. They were born into this indoctrination. They're born into this system. And when they start questioning it, they realize how much they try to control. So, you know, coming back to Jay's, point in a very roundabout way like this is built into our dna the moment we kind of pop out so until you really wake up and question the ways in which you're trying to control your partner you're trying to control the system you're trying to control the uncontrollable which is fucking unnecessary suffering you're probably not mm. going to know the levels of suffering you're causing yourself that are really unnecessary well that's the tyrant king isn't it like, like yeah. that's that spot that's on. that no, you know, new life is scary. New life is threatening to my kingdom. So any sort of autonomy that you you, you set, use your partner, any autonomy that your partner has, oh, that's a threat to me. What's going on over here? Um, and it really does become that tyrant king archetype that we've seen a lot of in the last two years. I mean, we've probably seen the tyrant king in its strength um, the last two years. Jay, were you, um, sorry, mate, were you about to say something? Mate, just the last little touch on it. It's just to, if I look at something and I, am I'm so dead set that it has to be a certain way and this is my way and it's this is I'm right. Mm. I'm not on. Like if I can't see another way, mm. it shows there's a lack of awareness or there's blinkers on. There's a blind spot in that area. It's just mm. now that I've, I've learned from work with you boys and you boys calling me out on things and that kind of stuff. Just to go, if I'm so set on this it means that I'm narrow focused on something because there, mm. there is only one way there, there can't be. And it's my reality maybe, but that, and who, and who am I to say that that is the only right way as well, that that, that thing should be. Um, and that's been a, that's a slow level of like slowly awakening. And it can be a smack in the face sometimes. And to, to touch on your point, Blake, you around all that control stuff came from, it was coming from a place of fear because I felt weak mm. and fear myself. 
I was searching to control whether it was a, you know, how a partner showed up or, you know, how things played out in my, in my, my job. And, and that comes from feeling so unstable within my, within myself mm. it goes back to, again, what can you do within yourself to um, build more, more of a solid foundation so you don't feel the need to control the other stuff. Mm. I think the other thing, just a final bit to that, Jay, you, you said around if you're super narrow focused, that there's lack of awareness or control, fear, whatever it might be. The other piece that it can be, and obviously you guys know I'm working through this at the moment, is having baggage around the opposing side. Mm. So if you're like all in, you've probably, you know, that shadow side, you've probably got some baggage around it. So that's where the duality of like, it's not always and very rarely black or white. And if you are so narrow-minded on something, you actually really want to explore what is at the other end of that scale, which is beautiful work in itself. Love it. <laughs> I know exactly where your mind's going too, but BWT, we love that, mate. Uh, Jay, brother, thanks for sharing those wins, mate. It sounds like it's been a, a real solid year for you and it's been awesome from Blake's, I'll speak on behalf of Blake because I, I like to do that. Blake and I's uh, perspective, we've loved seeing it grow. Um, beat ups. What is? He still got his. He's still got his third to go, mate. He hasn't finished yet. He's still. Oh, you got, you got one more, mate. How many? How many still... wins you got? How many wins you got? Three. It's got three. Three. Three, bro. three. Let's go. Sorry, mate. Let's go. Give me that. Give me the third win. Give me the third you win. Cut me off. You've had enough. This... No, 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 mate. I, I, I want more. Give me more. Actually, but Blake. Can you jump off the call? And I just want to speak to, to Jim Noah <laughs> about his wins. Um, so the um, <laughs> the third the third win is, is more of an uh, an overarching one, and it's literally I sit here sometimes and look at like my mental health, my physical health, and my current situation of life in terms of my friends, location, business is the best it's ever been and the win for me is and also and taking a level of ownership that i create all that as well like i don't look at that as you know so like oh you, you know you're lucky you're all right like, fucking no you know i've made decisions i burnt the boat you know i quit jobs that were safe and earning me good money had a clear career progression you know i um throw myself into courses that didn't make sense did you know, very some very out there you know programs and, and stuff to go out of the, the compass. <laughs> Blake, he's like, you know, um, you know, and it was all, you know, I burnt the boat. I, you know, like all three of us, there was a point where I, I got ego out the way and I was working at a cafe to fucking support the business that I wanted to create and to, to know that I've now created it and the investment in myself in time and, and energy and, and finance is now paying off to the fact that, I like when I, you know, think about myself and look at myself in the mirror, I'm like, yeah, like this is what I've created for myself. I've got fucking epic connected friends. I'm in an amazing location. I feel like physically, I feel great. Like mentally, I'm so confident mentally that I can get through whatever, you know, I get thrown is a really, really great place to, to be. So it's more just around like a level of gratitude for the life that I've created for myself now. And then looking back at how I was and I didn't, I never had a bad life. Like I was working for a great company and, and all the rest. And people said I was a pretty sort of happy guy, but internally I was never satisfied. I was like, mm. this is it? Like, it's never felt good. You know, I was literally, just a, as you know, I was a fucking loose unit was just leaving for the weekends. When, you know, party Friday, Saturday, Sunday, because that was my excitement. And then, you know, piss money up, up against the wall up my nose or whatever. And then go back and work for the week and recover by Wednesday. And, and it probably looked fun from the outside, but I wasn't happy or satisfied. And there was a hole that I was missing and I feel like, I've sort of, I've taken a different path and had a crack and I've created this world for, for myself and called in the people that I align with, that I love, that I love to be around. Like my, my friend group is, is solid and there's still some old friends that are still part of my world and, and, and all the rest, but it just feels so, um, it's kind of exciting to know what you can create for yourself. And so that's probably more of an overarching um, gratitude, I suppose, in, in terms of where I'm sitting now. Man, that's good. That brings a massive smile to my face hearing that, brother. Do you want to delve a little bit deep in, deeper into that man without purpose? Talk mm -hmm. like you know, talk to me about that Genoa that had no purpose and and as you said, was just blowing money up his nose and and you know, living for the weekend. Because I feel like a lot of men and women can relate to that. Mm -hmm. Maybe 
not all the time, but there's definitely been periods of most people's lives where that's what they're doing, you know, is, is they're just living for the weekend. Well, part of it came from the conditioning of what I thought I had to be. Go, you know, mm. go for uni, get the job, work your way up, buy a house, get the partner. That was the pro, that's what I thought you do, right? But it never felt right to me. And so I was kind of mm. torn between this going through the motions and but there was, I was never working for anything greater. There was never anything I was driven by, like what was my impact, my legacy, my mission. I never even thought about those as concepts before. Mm. And, you know, I was just working because it's what you do. And I guess I was going to try to work up the company so I could earn more money and then buy a sick house in Sydney somewhere and then get the partner and do the things. And so I had no idea about my values. If you ask me what did I value or what were my values within my career relationships, I would have better answer that for you. And so mm. I was just floundering my way through and I naturally found myself searching for the high of the weekend of the excitement. And then I, that, did, that, is, that became my comfort loop, right? So my comfort was to be out in the piss and partying and, and that kind of thing. And it was fun and I had a great time. And do I still party now? Yeah, I do. Um, but not destructively and so repetitively like I used to. Um, and so it, the real, the, I think the, the underlying thing was I had no real, and it's a sort of cliche, underlying purpose or why or, or mission. I was just doing what I felt I was supposed mm. to do, going for the motions. I was fucking directionless, really. And so when I finally started to sort of lift the head and peel back the layers and go, what am I really here to do? You know, what are, what are my unique skills as a human being? How can I make people feel? What can I do? It didn't have to be something huge. It didn't have to fucking save the world. When I started to open up a bit to that, that's when things started to shift. And I was like, oh, there's there's something more here. So um, and that was, it was, again, it wasn't, I didn't set out to find my purpose. It, it actually, it was literally by starting to meditate. It was the first bit of work I ever did in myself. It was when I started to, the lens started to sort of widen a little bit. And I was like, oh, is there something more? Is my way not the only way to do things, you know, is getting drunker or higher or trying to pick up more girls, not the way to feel better about myself. You know? <laughs> and I, and I head up my ass, right? Yeah. And also that was what we were all doing and I'd hang out with the lads and how would I, how would I be validated or how would we validate each other? Money, how hard you went, how did, how well you went with girls, maybe you played a game of footy, even though I didn't because my fucking hammies were falling apart. But, you know, um, that was what it was all about. So validation also was very much driven by that kind of those external things. And there was, mm. I had no idea what I was driven by intrinsically. And so that was a big, um, big reason for feeling so lost and, and directionless. And then obviously the, the flip of that is to start finding a level of direction and then as a byproduct fulfillment in what I do. What does that process look like, Dave? Because, you know, obviously between the three of us, we work with a lot of people. I'd say 98 percent of people that really aren't satisfied with their lives and you know probably around the same percentage that aren't satisfied with their careers so what does that what does that process look like and what is what does it look like when you get in a car on your birthday last year and move to byron bay we didn't even move to byron bay to kingscliff at the time what's what's the what's the dialogue going on because at the time you didn't have a huge amount of work um, and you were semi-clear that you wanted to go down the meditation path that you weren't clear. What's the dialogue like, just so people can resonate, because your dialogue, I remember, is pretty similar to what a lot of people have got in terms of their internal dialogue, in terms of taking the big leap. It's just that you took it 18 months ago and they're still in idle. So a big thing for me was getting clear on like, what's important to me in terms of what I, what I value. Right. And so it was a okay, case so of what's really important to me, whether it's in like in my in my working environment, in my relationships and, and, and friends. And for me, I got clear of some things like freedom is a fucking big one for me that, that stems through. Right. Level of, you know, authentic um, co connection is really, really um, in, important to me. Now, growth has really risen up for me in terms of, of my values. And when I got clear on what those things were. I had some kind of, I had a bit of a, a, a bearing, a bit of a, uh, um, what's the word? Like a North Star, I suppose, as to these are things that I want to always maintain within my world. And so no matter where I was, where I was going, those things I could look at and try to bring into what I was doing. Another piece around it was 
to get clear on what really like what fired me up. So this is that concept around finding you know, your mission and, and what, and I was like, okay, so what, what really in this world, like what experiences have I had in the past or what have I done that um, I now am really driven by what really fucking gets me going and, and ha- what I want to bring to the world. So what do I want to contribute as opposed to what can I get for everything? And when I got clear on what that sort of stuff could look like for me, like it didn't matter like where I was, like there was the things that I, that were important to me and I can use my location, whatever I was doing as an avenue to do all these things. Like you didn't like and even re- redefining what, you know, freedom can, can look like, you know, I had this idea of what, you know, freedom actually um, meant. And even, I mean, we'll probably talk about this next time in terms of relationships as well. It's a whole nother um, area for me. Um, but that was the, the process of getting clear on those things for me. And then knowing that, getting clear on what they actually mean and look like and then looking at well, how can I no matter where I am or what I'm doing or what's going on or if money's coming in or 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 whatever um knowing that I can have the power to bring them into the, the world no matter where I'm where I'm at um and that gave me a lot of solidarity uh, as well um knowing that I had those um uh, those things clear in, in my mind it's like that beaker so whenever I fell off the wagon or things were going shoot I'm like none of these are what's important to me to get back on, on on this again and not being mm. dependent on external things to give me them. Powerful. Beautiful. Powerful, beautiful. Beautiful and powerful. Uh, uh, BWT, do you have any wins that you'd like to share with us? Um, Great right, chat, lads. Thanks for asking yeah. the question. It's all right, mate. Beautiful. Beautifully said, Jay. Um, Love it. Yeah, it's, it's similar to Jay. I won't go too much into that, but similar to Jay, it's been the best year of my life, which um, probably, to be fair, the best 18 months, you know, from literally the day we got in the car on Janelle's birthday last year and left Adelaide, it's literally been the best 18 months. So that in itself is an amazing feeling and, and similar to Jay um, and credit, you know, to Janelle and, and Dills as well and and even plenty of the people that have come through our different programs, like Mm. it's been a really tough year for a lot of people Mm. and, you know, we can't speak on behalf of everyone, but there's also a lot of people who have done the work, who have had their best year ever. So, you know, despite everything that's going on, amazing shit is possible no matter what the circumstances are as well, because it's easy Mm. to buy into the collective of like, it's been a really shit year. And we've created our best year ever as well. So um, that's been cool. But I think for me, the top three wins would be business relationship and my training and and business as well. Similar to Jay, um, this is probably my first calendar year of the new coaching business. Um, Jay gave a beautiful example of, you know, me not that long ago, emptying bins at a... um, event in Adelaide, which I think I sent you boys a video. Uh, yeah. It was a festival, wasn't it? Festival, that's it was right. a festival. It was a festival. You were outside, pulling the bins, taking them out. I wish I still great. had that video. You boys will have to send it to me if you still got it. But yeah, yeah. so it's, you know, one, one of the things I guess we can get caught up in is we're always looking ahead and, and chasing and, um, you know, working towards the next evolution of ourselves, our business, whatever it may be. But you know, a lot of the gratitude comes in realising that it wasn't that long ago that you were empty bins at a festival mm. or that you were a dish pig at your brother's cafe or that you'd moved back in home with your mum because, you know, you had nothing left and you didn't know what your ne- next move was. So for me, the first one would be business and where that's gone over the last 12 months. So I'd love to, because what I've witnessed from you pretty much is you in your prior life of PT growing a successful business then you've lost it had a real had a real hole and then again you've built yourself up from the fucking bottom right and full credit dude like you you were alone you went back home working for your brother you know for a lot of people that's fucking that's that's ego bashing to the fucking hill right what was your internal dialogue like when you're sitting there emptying bins you know and just fucking churn, i've seen you just churn through it like i'm fucking just you like that little bull who just keeps grunting through and grunting through and grunting through. And now look where you are. Like it's paid off. 
when you sit, you know, I'd love to get an idea of what's gone through BWT's mind when you're sitting there emptying fucking bins and going, fuck me, like, this is where I'm at in my, in my early 30s, you know, mm. and then the ability to keep showing up and showing up and mm. showing up because that's something that is, you know, quite rare to see and have the ability to do and to keep doing it again and again and again. Mm. And also to give more context to that question because I, I love that question is, on that previous high too. Like, it's not like that was your entire life. Like you were living in Sydney, you were living quote unquote, the life you were in helicopters, you were fucking doing all these really cool shit to then going back to that. I think I just wanted to highlight that, that there was also that, that fall from grace that Jay mentioned too. Well, that's um, to, to answer that bit first, Jules, that's probably what made that transition even harder. Not only you know, was the Sydney life really good and I made, you know, six weeks into a really healthy business in the eastern suburbs. But I also smelt the roses for 14 years in which I loved what I did. So that period where I was lost hurt. Like there's a lot of people that are lost, but there's a lot of people that have been lost their whole life. If you haven't experienced life aligned, Mm. which for me felt really aligned in terms of my health and fitness and I loved You know, as Jay said, I loved my Monday to Friday as much as I loved my Saturday, Sunday. I was never, I've, you know, been fortunate that from the day I left school when I knew I wanted to be a PT up until that, you know, the first 14 years, I loved my Monday to Friday as much as I did my weekends. And that's rare, especially at that age to work out what the fuck you want to do with your life. Mm. So to smell the roses and love what I do and then to have that very strong fast fall from grace hurt a lot, especially that directionless bit. But I think, you know, one of the pieces for me when I was emptying the bins at the festival, and I still remember it so fucking clearly, (laughs) is, and sending you boys a video, is that I've, like, I would say a good part of it's delusion, which isn't that helpful to those listening, but part of it's delusion, but part of it's is I've always believed that I would find a way. Mm. And I always knew to some degree that I wanted to do something in the coaching space. So even when I was really lost, I was like, I love coaching. And I like, I fucking live and breathe it every single day. I don't know what it looks like. and I don't know how I'm going to make a business out of it, but that's what I live for. So for me, that's always been the way. And I think, you know, you guys have heard this story a thousand times. So I don't want to kind of bore, you know, everyone with it, but like, it always came back to just winning the day. Like when I was, when I was emptying the bins, I still trained in the morning. I still read that day. I still connected with someone. I still ate well. Like I didn't necessarily look at my, you know, 10 year plan, but I was like, okay, I've won the day, you know, the bins, you know, emptying the bins is pain for me to slowly get out of this. So it's still like, everything still serves a purpose. Emptying the bins was a really beautiful piece of humble pie and it was pain for me to find a way out of that as well. So, um, you know, no matter what you're doing, you can find a way to tie it into, some, you know, a way in which it's going to support you, get yourself out of the, mm. the hole. Yeah. It's funny. I had a similar experience 2019 um, where I had to fly up to Sydney. I was living in Melbourne. I had to fly up to Sydney and um, had to go to one of my best mates from high school his his mum tragically passed away and so went to the went to the funeral and i was surrounded by all my old high school mates i'm an i'm an eastern suburbs boy from sydney that went to a private boys school and there i was working at a cafe still at that stage little bit unsure about what i wanted to do similar to what you just said i knew i wanted to be in coaching didn't know what it looked like um so i was a barista in melbourne um, and there I was surrounded by my high school mates having a standard conversation. Oh, what are you up to, mate? Haven't seen you in a while. How's, how's your life going? And, you know, each response is, oh, I'm an accountant. Oh, I'm a lawyer. Oh, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And what are you doing, Dill? And that massive smack the ego of, oh, I'm working in a cafe. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> like it fucking rattled me. Um, and what did you do? Because my process, and I guess might be similar, might be different to, to what you did, but I've always you tried not to use my ego to actually propel me into the right direction. Mm. So for me, it hurt my ego, but I was going to use my ego to come back the next time I saw them and, and be better than where I was at, right? 
So how did you, I guess, eat the humble pie and not let it crush you or not let it keep you in that place, but actually utilize it or integrate it healthily to get to you, to where you are now? <clears throat> this, like, <clears throat> one of the things that I don't struggle with, and I feel so fortunate because I know a lot of people struggle with it, is motivation. And like, I mean, Jay's seen me every day for, you know, just about every day for closing on two years. Like, it's just not a struggle. You know, there might have been five days in the last two years where I felt flat. <clears throat> and in those bins, moving back in home with my mum, which I've got a better relationship with her now, but at that time I didn't. You know, mopping the floors for my brother's cafe. Like, ego aside, if those moments aren't enough to keep pushing you forward because mm -hmm. you don't want to go back there, then I don't know what is a strong enough driver, you know? And mm -hmm. they're like, that's three layers of what for me is multi-layered in terms of my why on a daily basis. You know, like I, I still remember those moments. I just remember so clearly the moment I was on a hospital bed, the moment, you know, because mum and myself used to blow up a lot. The moments where I was sitting out the front of my own family home eating dinner waiting for my mum to go to bed because I didn't want to go inside and have confrontation with her you know the moments where like I was mopping the floors of my brother's cafe so I can get cash because I didn't want to put it through this you know like, don't chase after me you know didn't want to put it through the system and doing anything that I could to get you know to collect some coin to find a way out of where I was so Again, you, you, you know, similar to you deals with that moment, you don't really wish those moments upon anyone unless it's really good for kind of the humbling of the ego. Mm. But what they do serve is a passion and a driver for you to, you know, move away from those painful or those dark moments as well. Mm. That's why you're so good at um, cleaning and, and dishes because you spent so much time in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> You'd think I was better. You'd think I was better at cleaning the dishes at home than I am, but there's still some work to be done. There's some scarring around that, isn't there? <laughs> <You're> like, <"Come laughs> Do you know what? It just needs to pay him five bucks a day, so, and then he'll start That's all doing I need. it. Like, oh, That's yeah, sweet. I okay, I'll, I'll clean the dishes. Yep, let's go. A little bit of coin under the table when <laughs> I'm doing properly. <laughs> Good share, B Dubs. What's your second wind? You, you mentioned I relationships, I think. You said? Yeah. Maybe? Well, yeah. I mean, general relationships, similar to Jay, um, are the best they've ever been. And, you know, it was only a few years ago that I was feeling super lonely and super disconnected. And it was only two weeks, three weeks ago that I was speaking to my coach going like, um, I, I feel so lucky to have the people around me that I do that I actually have, you know, you guys know me, I'm, I'm actually more introverted than most people realise. But like, I actually need more alone time than I'm getting with the amount of good people that I've got around me. So mm -hmm. I've gone from one extreme to the other, but I think the big one is, um, you know, my, um, I guess the term is intimate relationship with my partner, um, which has just been amazing. It's, you know, it's obviously still pretty fresh five or six months, but it's, you know, I think Jay gave an example of the old hindsight of why things don't necessarily work out. And at the time of everything you've been through, you're like, fuck, you know, the breakups and they're hard and everything. But fuck, what a blessing that though, like all of that has brought me into the relationship that I'm in now, which, you know, is by mm. far the best relationship I've ever been in. Um, you know, by far the smoothest and, you know, probably alongside my first ever relationship, which Jay knows her, she's you know an absolute ripper of a human 15 years ago. It is just like, it's just easy. And, you know, it's easy to question a lot of, and like, we've got no doubt it's not always going to be easy. Let's kind of keep that, let's keep that, <laughs> let's keep that bit in check for sure. But it also brings to light, you know, those moments, I guess, in other relationships where they were really clunky, and you're like, fuck, what's wrong with me? Like, why isn't this working? And then you get into something like this, it's just smooth, the communication smooth, everything, you know, is aligned. It's just, you know, I guess the easiest I've ever been in and the most um, connected and fulfilling as well. So that's been a massive um, win this year for sure. What part of that is you know, not to put a percentage to it, but how much of that is finding the right partner and being the right partner? 
you know, because so many people talk about finding the one, finding their king, finding their queen, finding that life partner. And there's a lot less talk about, well, being the right partner and I need to step up and I need to work on myself and do these certain things. So like upon reflecting upon your past relationships and the one that you're in now, how much of that has been actually you becoming who you need to be in order to either bring in this kind of relationship and attract it or to actually just show up as your best self that then allows your partner to show up as their best self? Like what is that, that balance do you think? Yeah, it's a fucking brilliant question. It's, um, it, it, it's Thank you. both. Yeah, you're right. It's, <laughs> it's both really. Um, again, Jay probably can attest to this more than anyone. Having um, seen my last proper relationship and then obviously you guys both know, you know, someone who I saw last year for four or five months, which I wouldn't necessarily call a relationship, but we kind of would have seen each other for a while. And, you know, off the back of both of those, I learned a shitload, but the difference in this relationship and, and in hindsight, what every relationship really should be is <clears throat> a level of awareness and ownership to see the challenges that come up in the relationship as really something for you to step into as opposed to they're not right, this is wrong, they're hard work, whatever it may be. Like I think about my last proper relationship two, three years ago, whatever it was, a lot of what she brought to my attention, I was like, fuck, you know, bullshit, whatever it might have been, you know, push, pull, whatever. And only to go and read a lot of what she was saying in books, you know, for the next 12 months and go, fuck, she's absolutely right. Like all of this stuff was on me. And just, you know, time and time again, I found myself just going, shit, shit. And, and really, you know, between the two of us, and for whatever reason this year, I don't know what's going on, but I've had so many healing conversations with, um, you know, the last three partners in, in, into a place where it really is such a, like a beautiful energy that I've got with them and I have the most, you know, um, care and, and admiration for all of them. But really a lot of that shit came down to me, you know, like a lot of the stuff I had to do a lot of work and... I guess the way that I see things now is through a really different set of lenses in that anything that comes up between me and my partner is really an opportunity for growth, an opportunity to reflect on my wounds, my stuff, and really an opportunity for us to connect and come deeper and closer as, as a result of it, as opposed to um, you know disconnect and create resentment and, and that kind of push-pull um, that can happen as well. So a lot of it is on her and she's fucking, as you both know, you know, the most incredible human. And um, a lot of it's in the work that I've done in particular the last two years. Well, Jay, do you want to touch on that, mate? If you've, it'd actually be probably pretty good to get your insights looking outwards, inwards onto BWT's personal life. Put a magnifying glass to it for us, please. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, it might funny. I was actually going to ask a similar question to, to you, um, uh, Deals, because obviously a big part of this is in terms of your relationships is the work that you've done on, on yourself. And so mm. I would argue that it really does um, come down to what I've noticed, your ability to old instinct would have been project, they're fucking doing this or they're bloody doing this or rah, rah, rah. Mm. And now it shifted to almost like you have this ability to sort of pause and go, Right, that's pissing me off but what am i what's my part to play in this mm. and i think that's quite as simple as it. it's not about it's, it's not about taking blame for everything at all there's always two parts to play but what what is your part to play in this and this is what i see you do amazingly is whether it's you know in the relationship that we have as business partners and mates or in your relationship you know with you with your partner whether it's okay this is this is what's going on where do i go to the work and this is what i love to see is there's always like okay, what's my part to play in this? What can I actually impact and control within myself? And so do I go speak to, you know, um, your coach? Do you go, you know, do a course here? And, and I think that's, without overcomplicating it, that's the most simple part of it. Because as soon as we project and push or play victim or blame and blame and whatever else and shame and inflate someone else, we just fucking give ourselves that. And 
Yeah. The, the, the basic thing is like what we're experiencing in our life is a reflection of our internal world. What we're calling in, what we need to experience. What, you know, what's the... Um, Crohn's, Crohn's quote, your favorite. You used to talk about it every second day, you know? Yeah, well, I did. I did. You, um, people experience the show where you're not free, right? I feel like you've embodied that hugely. It's like, okay, I'm not free here. What can I do to help this? While well, still maintain boundaries and accountability for the person, but that's a really, really solid place to, um, to, to be. And that's what I've seen re-evolve really for, for you um, over the last little period. I think... Um that's been by far my biggest lesson in the last month or so. I was always the projector. I was always the, nah, the relationship didn't work out because of my partner. <laughs> and I would always, and you're right, you're spot on Jay. What that does is it protects you from a level of like internal, um, internal reflection. Because you're like, oh, well, why didn't the relationship? Well, it's them. You know, it was their fault. But if, you know, and it also, I think a lot of um, people get fall into the trap of like, oh, when I find the right one, it will feel right and I'll know. And that too, just that statement stops you from addressing what whatever the issues were your, and your role to play in that past relationship because you're going, well, it just wasn't the right person. So there's no sort of like, well, I'm, I need to reflect on myself and, and change. And my latest relationship we that we just that I just split up from really highlighted that beautiful relationship, beautiful person. Could not fault her and how she showed up. And then it so it really forced me to go, well, mate, that's you then. <laughs> like, deal, that's that's your shit, brother, that you haven't worked through. And that's the next step where I'm at now, it's like, cool. Okay. We found quote unquote, the perfect partner and it didn't work out. So it's not her fault. <laughs> That's fucking on you. And it took me to go through the quote unquote, perfect partner to go, Oh fuck. I'm the problem. I'm the prick. I'm the, you know, this, that, and that we not from a place of um, self like negative talk, but from a place of like, okay, fuck, it's time to own this and, and work through it. It really, um, that exact moment for me, I, I had two of them. And one of them was actually when I interviewed Dave, Dave Harvey. And I, I think it was for our podcast. It might, it might have been, you know, nine months ago when we were doing those Insta Lives. And listening to the level of um, gratitude and appreciation he had for his wife, has, mm. not had, has for his wife, Cass, who, um, you know, is, is a fucking amazing human being. I remember my in, internal dialogue in that moment of going, fuck, I wonder what makes her um, so special or so unique. And in that moment, I was like, mm. fuck, that's me. Because, you know, my exes are absolute brilliant human beings. And I I got really, like, emotional because I was like, like, I want that level of gratitude and appreciation for my partner. And they, des and they deserve it. Like, they're fucking amazing human beings. So that was a real kind of moment that shook me up. And I went and did some work with my coach then and realised that on a deep level, whether it's, you know, the indoctrination of this masculine feminine, whether it's a relationship I've had with my mum, that I haven't appreciated um, and had the level of gratitude that I want for the feminine. And, you know, those two moments, I think, happened within the space of a week and they really rocked me. And, um, yeah, it was probably one of the most emotional moments, albeit, you know, I didn't show it on the call, that I've probably had in the last 12 months of, like, like I love that bloke. I love the level of appreciation and gratitude he shows for cats. And absolutely, she's amazing. And so are the women that I've been, you know, fortunate enough to date. And, you know, I wasn't able to express that, show that, embody that with them. And that's been a real wake up call for me as well. You say your probably number one most emotional moment would have been two weeks ago on Saturday night. What'd we do? The demons, boy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How did you forget, mate? As yeah, if you were wow. Jeez. So Dave's moment is number two. <laughs> behind the demons, we didn't play. Just for context, for anyone listening, so, you know, 
the most diehard demon supporter. Or Nuffy. Just team supporter. Nuffy, we call him. Nuffy. You know, he's, he's a guy who wears his beanie at the game and be down the front, like, dancing and cheering and trying to give a high five to the to the boys. And we watched the, the grand final. And so people came over and it's like, don't speak to Blake, don't even worry about it. He's sitting there with a bottle of champagne and a champagne glass, watching the Ds and the, the game finished and they're singing the song. And I look across, I've never seen the man cry so much. It's those balling guys out, <laughs> the glass of champagne in hand is sipping away. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, <laughs> uh, great oh, to see. Still gets me, still gets me right now. <laughs> As he's tearing up. Uh, BWT, third win, brother. Um, it kind of, it ties in a little bit with life, um, with the general theme just being consistency, but really just my training. By the time we release this podcast, I should potentially have um, completed the event, but just the training over the last, I guess, 12 months um, in the lead up to an Ironman, I've, I've been you know fortunate enough to do some really challenging things physically but nothing to this level and you know for me there's a real piece that um really draws at my um energy and my fire in challenging myself mentally and or physically and this is obviously something that will challenge both of those but the piece for me which you know i've probably heard a thousand times before but it's landed this time for the first time is that it's who you become in the process. And that's really valuable in a number of ways because it's kept me present week to week of what I need to do for that week, the challenges that come up, the stories that come up. And it's also taken a lot of pressure off the result itself. Like I become a new person training for this event and then the event itself is the cherry on top. So that that would be my third one, um, that physical training and having that real stretch target of an Ironman. So there's almost a piece there for you. What I'm hearing is around, which is where a lot of us get caught up in, is the end goal. And that's, mm-hmm. that's what we're working on while it seems you're taking a lot more time and effort to realise that the transformation is actually coming in the process and journey of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah, 100%. It's even, you know, I remember back the first day, Jay, you, you kind of remember as well, is I was sitting up at 90 kilos and, you know, I think the first, you know, you and I were doing 440 up at Byron Bay, which is, you know, amazing. And I went to do my first session with the triathlon guys and they just absolutely fucking wiped me. It's like five 1Ks with a one minute split. They had pretty much got around, had their one minute recovery, were starting to run back around. And I was coming in like this fucking sweat hog at 90 kilos, just finishing my first one K while they're about <laughs> to take off for their second one. So it's those humbling moments. And, and even, you know, a real simple belief that held me back for so long was, you know, when I was 19, fuck, 17 years ago, whatever it is, I had a real chronic tendonitis in my knee. And, you know, I can't remember the last 17 years exactly but I don't think that I've ever really allowed myself to run two days in a row. I've always had this belief of like, you get Mm. sore knees, you shouldn't run two days in a row. And then I remember back in like March or something, my coach had me running four days in a row. And I remember it exactly. I was like, fuck, I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm going to get sore knees. Story that I've had for 16 years, I've never challenged. Run four days in a row, fine. And, you know, before you know it, you're up doing, you know, I think I did back-to-back 18K, 18 kilometer runs or back to back 20s and absolutely fine. So just some of the small stories that you push mm. through and you work through, you know, over the course of 12 months that enable you to get to the event in itself, you know, are blown away forever as well. What what's what I'm hearing and what what's coming up for me is David Goggins training for life. And I mm. think that's how a lot of people need to start looking at their training. You know, we've got muscle as one of our pillars here at momentum but train for life you know you're not you're not getting up and challenging yourself for the iron man you're doing it so that you can become a newer more improved more resilient you know fit fitter person of who you are and so you're training mm. for life and it's saying that i've tried to integrate a little bit more into my training this year because i i was for five or six years just a free waiter get me get me in the mm. gym let me do my bicep curls. Let me do my bench press. Let me go home, drink a protein shake, right? And then coming to 
well, over COVID, all the gyms shut. So I had to do more at home training, more a little bit more running, a little bit more HIIT training, coming to Byron, gone and done body fit and loved that style of training, which is not really how I like to train, but I've, I've found that I've really loved it. And the way that I was able to do that was just by going, okay, well, I'm training for life now. I'm doing these exercises. I'm pushing myself a lot harder than I have the last few years. And I'm doing that to see the kind of person that I can become, the, the resilience factor that you talked about. Mm. I think it's really important. Mate, hundred percent. And that's, yeah, it's, it's something that I haven't mentioned, but um, that is for me as significant as anything is, you know, going through that challenging period for 15 months, going to the bottom and also um, coming out of that, but also coming out of it in a physical and resilient way. Like, you know, I said this a few weeks ago to Jay, like, I don't know what could get thrown my way, knock on wood. I don't know, I'll be keen to not, not, <laughs> Don't put that out there. Don't put it out there. <laughs> uh, like, shouldn't. Oh, really? <laughs> you, ready? you ready, motherfucker? <laughs> uh, I'm going to pull back on that sentence and I'm going to say I'm more resilient than I've ever yeah. been and that feels good. <laughs> there you go. That's better. That's better. Yeah, that's safer. Much safer. Deals, what about you? What's, um, what are your wins of uh, 20... What year are you in? 2021? 2021. Well, I think I'll, I'll continue the trend that the three of us have, which is just this year's been a great year for my business, but more so from the point of view of of that struggle, you know, are you struggling a very, I've never struggled that much just because of how fortunate I am with my life, but the, the pace, the internal struggle of looking for purpose, wanting to find purpose, having a real deep sense that the nine to five is not for me. I know that I don't know what I'm going to do, but it, that's definitely not for me. And, you know, the last since, since high school, so seven, eight years of, trying to navigate a space and doing everything under the sun. And then it kind of culminated into literally 12 months ago, starting my new business, Prince to King mentoring, stepping up in that space and really succeeding, you know, right off the bat essentially in that and just loving seeing the impact I've been able to have on the young men, um, similar to the work that we do with Momentum you know, like anything, it can be a bit draining. You can get a little bit over it. You can kind of lose your why a little bit, but then you have those moments of bang, a parent reaches out to me or a kid gives me some feedback about how the coaching or the mentoring is helping him and just how much that fires me up and just goes, yeah, this is, this is absolutely what I'm meant to be doing right now. And so just that and, you know, obviously the financial piece of stepping out and being more independent, working full time in my business for the first time over the last 12 months and living a pretty good life. I was in Hawaii, then I was in LA, then I was back in Hawaii, then I flew to Byron. and I've spent four months here in Byron. and I'm, a, I'm, you know, by the time this podcast releases, I'll be back in America. Um, so, yeah, just really grateful for my business, grateful for momentum and the success we've seen in momentum too over the last 12 months. Um, and just the impact I think is big, the impact that we've been able to have at momentum, the impact that we've been able to have in our own businesses and, and yeah, the impact that I've been able to have in my own business. One of the things that you um, almost just corrected yourself on then, which I love as one of your stories, and I think a lot of people probably carry a lot of shame around it, is it's well documented that obviously you had a good upbringing. We both know your parents, they're fucking absolute Jedis. But it feels like there's, I'm going to use the word shame, but you, you, you bring your own um, flavour to it. Shame in the struggle because relative to other people, it's not, you know, it, it's on a different page or whatever. And I feel like there's a lot of us in Australia who might um, struggle with this concept as well of like, fuck, I feel like I'm struggling or, or, or you know, I'm in a really dark place, but I shouldn't be because I've got a good job, I've got a good wife, mm. I've got a good family. What What's that dialogue? I know this isn't related to business, but I think it's really important. Yeah. What's that dialogue like for you, knowing that you did have a good, a brilliant upbringing, yeah. And yet you still have your dark moments. You still have your struggle. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you almost feel like you need to, as you almost did then, justify the struggle relative to other people's struggle. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, it, it, it's such a great question because I had to work on it pretty early. Like when I was 20 years old, I got diagnosed with depression and anxiety. And that was the main emotion that came up for me was like, what the fuck do I have to be depressed and anxious about? I'm 20 years old, lived an amazing life that I would say 95% of the population could only dream of. Why the fuck are you depressed and anxious? And so from 20 to, you know, there's definitely still elements of it residual, but for the most part, I've worked through it 20 to 25. I had to really work through that. And the internal dialogue now is because shame, shame is the right word and it's, and it, and it is accurate and saying it's shame. The dialogue now is there's no, there's no use. There's no use to me in my progression as a human being to feel shame about my struggles. It does not, it doesn't help me at all. There's no use in holding shame in that area. All it does is it keeps me there. It doesn't allow me to look at it because you don't want to look at shame, right? So if I'm struggling, you don't want to look at it. And if I feel shame about it, so it's not going to help me look at whatever it is that I'm struggling with, address it and then move through it, get a co- do whatever the appropriate steps are, get a coach, journal, meditate, change something in my life. It, it doesn't suit me. So I've been able to work through the shame piece by just saying, well, everyone's struggles are valid. Everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a billionaire struggling with running a 500 person company, or if you are, you know, having to move home with your mom and and work for your brother, right? Like everyone's struggle is relative to their life and everyone's struggle is, is a valid emotional human experience. And so once you can drop the shame around that piece, I feel you're able to have the ability to move through it. And one distinction that I've made is perspective versus comparison. Perspective is great to have, have perspective. Hey, I've lived a great life and I'm really grateful for the life that I've got. That gives me perspective. Comparison is saying I'm not allowed to struggle because other people are struggling more than me. That doesn't serve me, right? I, so I can struggle in my perspective. Fuck, I've had such an awesome life. I'm really grateful for the upbringing. I'm grateful for my parents. I'm really grateful for all of that. And that anchors and keeps me grounded so that I don't sink into my own despair and hopelessness, right? Because that keeps me grounded. But it doesn't, it doesn't stop me from reflecting on my struggles and going, hey, they're fucking real and I need to address them. Otherwise, I'm going to stay here. Great answer. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, boys. Thank you. Thanks, boys. Um, <laughs> what, a, what about number two, mate? What's your second yep. win for the year? Number two is probably putting my money where my mouth is, I would say. Um, I've invested a lot of, without putting, I put invested a lot of money into my own personal development this year. And I think it's been, it's been really key to me having a great year amongst a fucking pandemic where like, yes, I've been livid and angry and emotional about what's going on. And I've had my struggles throughout the year, but it's, I'm really fulfilled. I think fulfillment is the right word to use. And so the wins just been, I've really invested into that. Like I've, I've had to work to get to that place I fuck my least favorite, one of my least favorite words in the human dictionary is lucky. I, I, I fucking hate the word lucky um, because people don't see any of the stuff that gets any of us to where we are now, right? Outside looking in, people are looking at Genoa gallivanting around Australia and moving to Adelaide, then to Byron and living his life and shirtless in the sun meditating and like, oh, wow, Genoa is so lucky he gets to do that. You know, fuck off right? Genoa's had to do this work on that. He's had to invest thousands of dollars here. He's had to show up in a business. He's had to, you know, get get rid of his limiting beliefs around fucking every area, right? Like people don't see that, but they see the, oh, the overnight success of how lucky is he to live in Byron? I, I fucking hate it. It, it. it pisses me off so much hearing that um, because people don't see the hard work that goes behind it. And so for me, it was just, it was showing up 
as a coach and getting more coaching and saying, okay, I need to invest my money into the areas where I'm really struggling or I'm really lacking, or there's a pattern that I've noticed here. Um, and the, the best thing that I've done this year was working with, with Pixie, with working with Julianne, because that work that I'm doing with her right now, and, I'm, and as I'm speaking now, I'm right in the middle of it. It's not enjoyable work. It, like it, it's heavy shit and it's fucking, it's not fun by all means, but <laughs> I'm making it fun because I realize that this is like going to be really good for me. It's, it's amazing. Like the shit that I'm moving through right now, it's stuff that I've been carrying for 27 years and um, to move through it and feel it moving out of me and, and stepping up. It's, it's awesome. So that's definitely been my, my second win of the year is just, is just, I've, I've probably been a bit of a preacher at times without embodying what I'm preaching. And I've made it my theme at the start of the year. I said, oh, my theme needs to be embodiment this year. And I feel like for the most part, I've been the most embodied that I've ever been. Yeah, mate, it's watching you, watching, like, obviously, only having really known you for the years that we've worked together, which has almost what, been two, two now, almost. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's probably one of the biggest shifts that I've seen. It's just, to, it's just to reinforce the importance of, and this is what we talk about a bit, right, where we're all good at listening to the podcasts and reading the books and blah, yeah. blah. We can regurgitate a few quotes here and there and all this and that. Yeah. That doesn't mean fucking shit unless you're really willing to step into the discomfort. You know, mm. and out of the three of us, Blake leads in, in doing that kind of work, always like throwing himself mm. into something. Um, probably that's one of the bigger shifts that I've seen in you over the last couple of years is is you've actually now like starting to step in. It's like, okay, I've got to sit in some fucking shit here and work mm. through this, not just read a book about it and go, yeah, I understand. Like conceptually, yeah. you can understand some stuff because, mm. you know, you're, we're, you're an intelligent guy. You know, you, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And we can get it. And this is where the mistake that I know I've made as well in the past where I'll, I'll listen and read and be like, oh yeah, I get that. That makes sense. Why are things changing? Mm. You don't fucking do anything about it. You know, and yeah. consistently over time also, it's not just what we're working here. What you're working through is, you know, a few decades of experience and conditioning and ingrained and a you know, mm. little hint of genetics here and there. So just to reinforce it, it's like, it's a constant process of showing up and, and stepping in and actually doing the, the, the work and, and challenging yourself. So I'd, I'd say, would that have been the biggest trans the biggest catalyst for the transformation, do you think, for you? I think so, yeah. I mean, it's been it, it, it will it will go down. I'm I'm big on recogn I, I I don't like the term self-made millionaire, self-made bill self no one's self-made. And I'm I'm so grateful for every little relationship and little interaction and little conversation that I've had in my 27 years that's really culminated in such gratitude for you, Genoa and you Blake in the last two years of, I look at my life now and I look at it if I didn't join momentum or if we didn't do momentum. And I'm like, there's no fucking way I would be where I am now without the container that we have. Again, we've intentionally built a container that goes and calls each other out in their shit and, champions as well right our champion and challenge piece so i think for me it's just having so much gratitude that like i couldn't have done this alone that it's not me i'm not fucking special i've just got intentional people around me that i have intentionally brought into my life and you utilize their expertise their knowledge there you guys are you know 35 years older than me so um you know i'm, I'm utilizing <laughs> right mate right right <laughs> <laughs> looking good the coconut the company aloe vera and coconut oil huh but i think i'm just really grateful for the for you guys especially that have challenged me along the way and and yeah helped me get to where i am i think the challenges at deals and you and i have spoken about this numerous times is you know whether it's your intimate relationship those closest to you friends family whatever it may be and jay just really touched on this is generally we like growth on our terms. We can read a book. It doesn't really evoke any kind of triggers, wounds, emotions. But when you're in the fucking fire and when your girlfriend, you know, is absolutely spitting chips at you and you want to go into defense block, mm. you know, justify whatever it may be, is that's 
that's when it's hard. And I think, you know, for a lot of us, if I look back at my previous relationship and you guys both know her, she's an absolute gem of a human, is I, I had conceptualised the importance of growth within the relationships, but I had, it hadn't really moved into an embodiment of it. Mm. And that was, you know, what I said to you before, that was where when we broke up and I was obviously in a lot of pain, the real deep work started. I was just kind of massaging the work when we were in the relationship. Like I could kind of hear what she was saying and I could kind of conceptualise it, but that wasn't hitting me in my body and that wasn't where the real change was happening. And I've, you know, you and I have spoken about this numerous times, whether it's, you know, your ex or your most recent partner, fucking amazing girls and absolute gold nuggets within that Mm. that will like penetrate your heart in a way that mm. is really uncomfortable. And again, you can deflect, defend, you can take ownership, but it's when you really move into the thickness of it, which you are now with picks that you're like, fuck, like, you know, they've brought, they've brought a part of me that I don't want to own. I don't want yeah. to acknowledge whatever it may be, but that's, that's where the real shit happens. Anyone can read a fucking book. So when we're talking growth, cool. We love that you read books. We love that you grow and expand in that way come in the fire and let's do the real yeah. shit as well. Yeah. Come I fire. think come in, the fire. come in the fire, come sit with us. I think too, something that, um, something that's dangerous is being a good communicator. And it, I say it's dangerous because if I, if you and I get into a disagreement and I'm a better communicator than, than you, and you might be right but I'm going to out communicate you and I'm going to be right by the end of it. And so there's, there's a lot of, with, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, right? <laughs> there's a lot of responsibility that needs to be taken for someone who's a good communicator. And I am, you know, you, you've mentioned it a few times, Blake, that that's my superpower is, is constructing arguments, picking apart other people's arguments and then capitalizing on that and winning arguments, right? It's, it's always been a strength of mine because my dad is a fucking unbelievable communicator. So I've modeled my behavior off of him where in my relationships, I'm trying to be right. And because I'm a good communicator and I've been a better communicator than all of my ex-partners is I'm never wrong. Not because I'm never wrong, but because you aren't capable of proving me wrong. So Mm -hmm. it's, you know, and I see my dad do it and I love him to bits, but it's definitely one of his areas for improvement is like, mate, I know that you can now argue mum, but you are wrong right now, you know? So just fucking sit in it. And that was something that I had to, that I still am working on is, is taking the advice, taking the feedback, sitting in it for a little while and then coming back with a response rather than going, well, I know exactly how to pick apart this argument. <laughs> like watch me, you know, and I've mentioned before, I've got a really strong dark magician that, dark magician archetype of like i can move in the shadows and manipulate and whoop and here i am i'm right you're wrong apologize to me you know and that's what fucking happened in my past relationships Mm. good good awareness brother good very good awareness what's um what's number three for you number three um again was probably brought to my attention by you boys is just my emotional roller coaster definitely 12 months was like you know, I'm trying to fit in the screen, but like that, it was, it was really high, really low, really high, really low. Um, and now just through the embodiment piece, through working with different coaches, through doing the work, through showing up, through consistency, through greater awareness, but greater awareness and then change, I've been able to lower that emotional roller coaster. So my day to day, my, my, my week to week or my month to month, there's not too much fluctuation now. And, and um, you know, I would say that that's been that third win is just more emotional consistency. Which may in itself is fucking amazing when I think the three of us can attest to the world projecting like motherfuckers at the moment we're seeing it everywhere and we're in a fortunate place where we've got a nice little bubble <laughs> not yeah. a, not too much of that penetrates our bubble but if you if you take a little kind of bird's eye view there's a lot of that happening mm. um externally so yeah full credit to you on that one for sure and i think the... 
um, sometimes what I see and what I've experienced as well is almost the addiction to the the high mm. is almost the fuel to allow yourself to go back down to the to the low again. Is that does that land at all? You know how like because part of the yeah that fucking high is like you've got to come for the contrast. It's like you almost yeah. get there and then you like you go back down. It's like and you get back up again, and that's often yeah. where that addictive stuff can play out as as well. Is that sort of it, it's um. It's multi-layered and you're spot on. It's, it's, it's a romantic viewpoint of the lows. It's like this, oh, like despair is beautiful and like mm. oh, the, there's beauty in the pain and it's delicious and juicy. It's like the writer or the poet or the, the, the singer, right? They have this real affinity to, to despair or to the sadness. Um, and, you know, again, it, it, it's highlighted in my previous relationships, especially when I was younger, as a young man, you know, you get addicted to like the girlfriend that, that is also like that. So like you go, it's fucking intense and it's amazing and it's awesome. And then it's, you're arguing at each other's throat, but that's fucking awesome. Cause it's addictive. It's like, you're living in extremes, you know, like, mm-hmm. Hey, at least life's not boring. At least I'm feeling something. And the consistency, if I'm, if I'm, my opinion, the consistency is boring. It's not fucking intense. You, you, you kind of wake up, you know, you wake up, you meditate, you do that every day. You wake up, you journal, you do that every day. It's not that exciting, right? But the intensity, that shit's exciting, you know, like fucking riding that wave up, riding that wave down. <laughs> that shit is addictive and fun and like awesome. So I think, mas- you know, mastering the mundane and, and being okay with, Hey, I'm feeling a bit off today. So I'm just going to go by myself, sit by the beach and just kind of sit there for a little bit. Like that's, that's boring, but like, it's the juice. That's the growth. That's the next step in the evolution. That's the consistency piece, you know, rather than like, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to numb myself for a little bit. And then tonight I'm going to get into bed at 10 PM and I'm going to fucking feel like shit. And I'm going to like, oh, yeah, bring me that intensity, baby. Like, no, nah, that's not, there's no growth to be had there. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's Boys. the uh, third win. Boys, very good wins. We did have the intention of doing wins and challenges. We did. But we're Part not two. ever close to getting all of it done. So uh, part two, part two coming part soon, two. I think. Yeah, part two will have to be done. I think will be the challenges. So this can be the wins episode. Boys, beautiful boys. Thank you, Blake, Genoa, Dylan. Good work. Good year. Well done, boys. <sighs> Till next time. See you downstairs. Thanks for tuning in this week. As always, if you enjoyed listening, please leave a review give us a shout out across socials or share with a friend so that we can continue to share these incredible conversations with more and more people.